What's going on, guys? Principal Prepper Live. Welcome. I uh, hope you guys have had a great week starting out. We have Robbie Wheaton with us today, which great. we usually do. and We like him when he's here. Uh, Robbie's been a gunsmith for over 20 years. Uh, he owns Wheaton Arms, and he does all the Glock, well, actually Glock aftermarket parts that are awesome, but he is also the official vendor for the Palmetto State Armory Dagger yep. for all their upgrades. So we're great to have you here. Great to be here. And Sarah Mack is over monitoring the comments. And if you have some questions, feel free anytime to pop in some questions and we'll take a break and you can, um, she'll bring those up to us. Uh, today, we're going to talk about something that um, I think is very important with the economy the way it is. This is not necessarily, now it does, it applies to it, but this is not necessarily a total, you know, Mad Max zombie apocalypse. This is something that a lot of people are facing right now mm -hmm. with our economy and with the inflation that we're seeing with food prices. I mean, you know, just going to the restaurant is ridiculous. Yeah. And, um, you know, we went to our favorite Mexican restaurant <clears> the other <throat> day and it was just three of us and it was over $70 mm -hmm. and it's just a regular Mexican restaurant, you know, that we eat at constantly and, and we do eat there constantly. But, um, you know, we're seeing prices going up in a lot of places. So we're going to talk about that specifically. But before we do, a couple of things. Uh, Exotac uh, sponsored today's video. And these are the best fire starters on the planet. And I'd say that because I've been using Exotac for a long time. They're made down in Winder, Georgia. So it's a great place to be able to pick up and build your fire kit. Fire kits are vital. It's one of the vital things you need in a survival situation or in an economic downturn situation. Mm. Uh, also, I want to just go ahead and bring this book up right up front, because this is the modern guide to the coming, uh, surviving the economic collapse. Well, this was actual events that happened in 2001 in Argentina. And this specifically applies to what we're talking about today. But this is a great book. Um, I have read this a number of times, and I highly recommend it. We'll have links down below in the description. And as far as Exotac, you get 20% off using Such20 with the link down below. But I know you guys use it because we get a lot of feedback from Exotac. And I hope that helps you as much as it helps us and them. So, um, but anyway, okay, we've got some things to, to address. And guys, with the economy, uh, you know, the, the one thing is, is there can be a lot of loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one of the things, too, is on the other side is during the Great Depression, there were a lot of people that became millionaires. Even during when millionaires would really equal to billionaires mm -hmm. today. Uh, and so we're going to kind of look at that a little bit because it may give you some ideas about some industries. One of the things about an economic collapse is that not all industries are affected. Some will thrive even more than others. Some will totally collapse. Some will just go away. But, you know, in an economic downturn, people have less money to spend. You know, you could have almost titled this how to create generational wealth during an economic downturn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. You, you could definitely do that. Yeah. Uh, and Robbie and I are both entrepreneurs, you know, so we have a heart for this already. But, you know, the thing is, let's talk about the different ones. There's I have four different examples of some of the, <clears throat> the people that really became wealthy. Mm -hmm. And one was Babe Ruth. Now, Babe Ruth became a millionaire because he was being paid so much, because he was so popular. And one of the things that that applies to is entertainment. And he was in the sports industry. People were still going to the ball game. You know, they weren't paying a whole lot back mm -hmm. then, but they were going to the ball game. They were still, you know, doing things. And they paid Babe Ruth quite a bit of money uh, because of his his talent and his ability. And so well, he was a showman, even though even though he played a sport, he was a showman. Yeah, he was. And he drew a crowd. Right. And, and you know, and it was and we we're seeing a lot of that. Of course, with social media, it's a little easier to get into. Now, not everybody's cut out for entertainment. So, you know, but so we're going to the next one. Uh, Michael Cullen, he actually the founder of what became Kroger later. But one of the things he did, he started grocery stores and during the Depression. And he built a big parking lot for automobiles, which was unusual. Uh, a lot of places didn't do that. And he made his profit margins just barely above cost. And so with that, he was able to get a volume of people. And so he, this was something that people had to have. They had mm -hmm. to have groceries. 
And so they went, you know, that was one of the things. It was a commodity. Uh, then we have J. Paul Getty, which was in real estate. And, you know, here's the thing, guys, you know, real estate right now is at an all time high. I mean, yep. it's crazy what people are paying for stuff. But there's a lot of economists that are talking about an economic collapse of the real estate market. If that happens, there's going to be a lot of property out there that's going to go for a lot less money. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say this first off. I'm not an economist. We're not professionals, but we do have some ideas and hopefully it'll help you to kind of at least start thinking in a different direction. But he was able to capitalize on that. And then when the market picked back up, he was able to step in and make a lot of money. And then we have um, Joseph Kennedy and, you know, that came from the Kennedy dynasty or Camelot or whatever. And he started out really with stocks. He would, in fact, he even manipulated the market some, but he made a lot of money knowing what stocks to buy. Uh, and that's one thing about it, guys. Again, this is not a collapse of necessarily. This is a collapse that could be, you know, a recession, a depression, inflation, all those things causing problems. And you're capitalizing on it, even with your stocks. If you have stocks and heavy in stocks on certain things that are affected by the economy, it's better to move those stocks. And of course, you need to talk to your financial advisor. Uh, I know John Lovell did something on this a while back where he actually sat down with his financial advisor and said, where can I put things that are going to thrive in a mm -hmm. downturned economy? Yep. It was a very good video and I highly recommend it. But, well, you know, it's like we went, we, we I watched the market a lot and, and, you know, I moved my investments around pretty, pretty frequently. And uh, when I, I saw this coming with a, uh, with the downturn in the economy and the downturn in the market, and I moved all of my stuff out of traditional stocks into uh, what's called a cash fund for a while until the, you know, the market, it dipped. And once the market dipped, then bonds really picked up, bonds started doing really well. And I moved a lot of my investments over into bonds uh, because right now bonds are, especially short term, short yield bonds are paying really well. So I moved a lot of stuff over into bonds and have done very well with them this year. And, right. you know, a lot of people look at the stock market and they're like, oh, man, I've lost so much money. I've lost so much money. It's, it's being aware of the market and what the market's going to do um, just based off of, you know, different trends, different economic markers and stuff. And you can, you can learn to recognize those and be able to move your, move your money around and, and actually make your money continue to, to grow for you instead of taking a huge dip and a big hit. That's going to take you the next five, 10 years to get back to where you were four years ago before the economy took a big downturn. And, and that's a good point because sometimes, you know, a lot of people have sold stock off mm -hmm. and then later on it goes up and really having some cash flow to be able to make it through those hard times. You know, a lot of times we have all of our savings, all our investment, in those things. Um, but those are th different ways to be able to categories is the main thing. Now, first off, and this is important because a lot of a lot of us and I'm, I'm one of those. I can get this. Way. And we're all guilty of this. Yes. Uh, we can be obsessed with prepping. Right. I mean, hey, we, you never have enough, right? You never have enough. You got to, you know, you haven't, you don't have enough food. We don't have enough ammo. We don't have enough guns. We don't have enough of these things. And so we're just on these buying sprees and we spend a lot of time messing around storage and everything else for these items. Now, I think you should have some items put back. I think I'm a, definitely a prepper and it's important to be able to have some contingency plans, uh, especially for the immediate. But how about taking that obsession with prepping and moving it over to your side gig? Now, you know, side gigs, and I've done this all my life. Mm -hmm. I've had side gigs. I listen, I think it's funny when somebody goes, Man, I work 40 hours this week. I'm like, <laughs> You're lazy. <laughs> what else did you do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I went boating and went to the ball game, and we did, the, you know, the thing is, is I've always had side gigs, and that's just me. But and my grandfather was like that, always had side gigs and the money is generated on those side gigs. If you can take that side gig and get your prepper itch on on top of that, it's a win win. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is having a way, an outlet to make money, to make money on the side. Yes, it costs a lot for things that you need for prepping and you can't do it all. So why not have some things to build your wealth? Because what happens is we store up all this food and then what if 
we never really need to go to it. Yeah, prices are really expensive, but we just, you know, it's not like an SHTF in that sense. There's still food. It's just more expensive mm -hmm. or it's fairly rare and it costs more to even more than. So having a way to regenerate what you're doing, you know, and to be able to pay for things and to build your wealth. And this is where thriving comes in is being able to have something on the side. And that's not all we're going to talk about. We've got some other stuff to some ideas. But first off, I would just highly recommend, guys, if you are obsessed with prepping, if when you get together with people, you have nothing to talk about unless they're preppers. <laughs> and guys, believe me, I've been that way with either guns or prepping. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else to talk about because that's <laughs> what I do. And so having a you know an outlet and to be able to move that into something. Now, one of the things that a lot of people do is they go, hmm, how can I make money? How can I make money? You know, thing is, is take what you like, what you do and mm -hmm. what appeals to you, because all successful businesses, almost all are started in a garage. They're started by somebody that was making cookies at their house yep. and they kept making cookies and they were giving them out. And somebody said, hey, you need to start a business. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my best friends did that, turned it into a multi-million dollar business. And, uh, and I worked for him for a number of years and it was just started in his garage. And before long, he ran out of room for cookies. So he had to get rid of them. <laughs> so, you know, it, there, there are so many different avenues uh, to be able to do that. And with the Internet and all the different possibilities, there are so many different things to be able to get into and to capitalize on. So and listen, guys, if if you're just prepping on the side, but you're so busy run into the lake every time you get a chance or, or you know, you're going to the ball games or you're sitting there watching TV. Honestly, a lot of that's great. And we all do that. Mm -hmm. But there is a part of that, which we we discipline ourselves to make sure that we're looking ahead. And so creating wealth to help you to thrive in those situations is going to be even better than just stocking up a giant supply of food and some of that, if it was a real bad situation, could be taken away from you. Well, you know, one of the biggest things I think that that most people have unrealistic expectations of is when they when they start a side gig. You know, most people, when they start a side gig, they they think they have the the greatest idea ever. And it could be it could be the greatest idea, the next big thing. But even if it is you're not going to become a millionaire overnight with it. Right. It's not going to happen. It's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of dedication. It's going to take a lot of perseverance and a lot of sacrifice to be able to make that side gig grow. And if you're not willing to put the time into it to grow that side gig, it's going to flounder and it's just going to die. The you have to be you have to be very dedicated with your time with your side gig and put the time into it to make it grow or it's just not going to happen. You know, it's funny. I have a, a friend of mine uh, that started a, a pack gear company mm -hmm. and um, she had some knowledge, but really, you know, started doing some things and it, it did good. It did okay. And it took a long time. And it was a lot of times she would say, man, it's roaring fire gear. And she'd say, man, you know, things are, you know, we're trying to get into here. We're trying to do this. And it was a lot of work. I mean, for about three or four years mm -hmm. of just throwing things up and trying to do the best they could. Yep. And then all of a sudden, and I told her this before, I said, it will happen. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden had some ideas and all these big companies started getting in touch with it. I mean, it was like, it's an, it's a, uh, a principle just like with YouTube. I mean, for me, when I started YouTube, of course, I didn't even know that they paid ads or anything. I was just making <laughs> crazy videos. But, you know, it took time to develop into something that became useful. And so, when, again, like Robbie said, he's spot on is having that side gig, especially if it's something, you know, that can mm -hmm. do well yep. is to, to, to hang in there because you will go through trials. You'll go through problems. You'll go through issues. But it's the ones that fight through it that really end up being successful That's in the right. long run. You will not start out typically being very successful. Mm -hmm. It's it's building up, building your clientele, building up your knowledge and learning things. My son came to me the other day and he said, man, I'm, I'm thinking about doing something. You know, he has a he wanted to get to a side gig and he's going, I'm really thinking about drop shipping. And he was just talking about all this stuff. He'd been doing a lot of research. And I told him, I said, don't necessarily wait 
for the best when you I'm waiting for this opportunity. I'm waiting mm-hmm. for this. Sometimes you just got to grab an opportunity and that's going to carry you to your next opportunity. This is really where you should be. So you're not necessarily locked in. If you get into something, it's going to, you're going to develop during that time and become a better, better entrepreneur, better person, know the market better. That's right. The best opportunity is the first step in starting something right that's that's the best opportunity grab what's right there in front of you the low-hanging fruit and start doing something right and you can transition yep. you can that's transition right. okay so now let's talk about assets a lot of people including myself i said i buy a lot of silver and gold uh, it's something that preserves my wealth and really in a real bad situation those prices go up gold has gone up gold's go, gold's gone way up mm-hmm. over the past few weeks it's gone up it's well over two thousand dollars an ounce. I think it was two thousand and thirty-eight dollars right now. Now I'm not. I didn't buy that gold and silver to make money on it necessarily. I'm buying it to to let it just protect my wealth. I'm putting extra cash in there, and so and then when the economy really turns, that's like in this book, uh, "Surviving the Coming Economic Collapse" by Furfow. It's one of the things he talks about is people actually that had some silver and gold put back because the peso just went to nothing. They were able, and the gold prices went up. They were able to pay off properties. They were able to pay off loans and, and things. And it was for a few days and then they had, they corrected it. But one thing too is a lot of businesses opened up that would take silver and gold in Argentina. We saw that in 2008 here in the U.S. where stores started opening and they put, we take silver. Mm-hmm. So don't pew pew or poo poo silver and gold, <laughs> your precious metals because that is a vital part. Now it's an asset and there's only so much that you can put back just like guns. Now people will go, well, my precious metals are brass, you know, copper and steel. Well, you mine too. But you know, the thing is, huh? Lead. Lead. (laughs) We got a lot of metals there. (laughs) Guns and ammo are great for putting some things back. I always call it my 401 G. That's right. And so we put that stuff back. And, you know, and so we, we do these things and we can trade them and we can wheel and deal. And it gives us something to barter with that was going to retain its value. But, and of course there are other things, obviously. And I was, I had something else. I just want to make sure I don't miss it. Oh, well just barter items. You know, you can have barter items. I've done a lot of videos on certain bar, barter items. Liquor's a big one. Liquor's mm-hmm. a great one. But here's the thing. You have a limited amount of resources. It's like, okay, I got it. And when that runs out, then what are you going to do? So unless you're trading and buying and moving up and think about that, guys, you know, if you're trading a gun, think about it. Don't go and just give that, you know, lose one or $200 right. by trading it. I was at a gun show this weekend and there were people walking around and they were getting, trying to get dealers to buy their guns. Well, those dealers are not going to give them market value no. because they have to resell them. I mean, I, it's, it was, it's, it's a legitimate thing. It's no different than trading a car. You know, you go and trade a car in, you're going to lose a third of the value of that vehicle because the auto dealer is going to have to turn around and resell that car to make a profit on it. Gun dealers are no different. They're going to give you about two th- a half to two thirds of the value of that firearm because they're going to have to turn around and resell it. And they've got their money tied up in inventory now uh, while it's waiting to resell. Right. Same they're way paying rent, company. they're paying power. Right. So, you know, it's a legitimate way to do business. But when you're doing some trading, and guys, again, you got to check your laws. I'm not but here in South Carolina. We're perfectly legal to do that. There may be different things to look at, but one thing you can do is auction houses. We, we that's a very good way to be able, and they're FFLs, so mm-hmm. they do it in a legitimate way. Yep. But a lot of times, you can make a lot of money doing that. Secondly, uh, putting guns on consignment, and that's one thing I do. If I have something that I'm like, I'm not going to be using this again, or I'm going to trade it out because I want something else. I'll put it on consignment at a local gun shop and he puts a small percentage on it. And then I end up doing pretty well. So there are ways to do it. But one of the things I want to tell you is in Argentina, a lot of people stored up ammunition to trade and barter with. And as soon as this started happening, they put a, they passed a law to where you had to have a license to sell ammunition. So, you know, there are some things like that that you got to be careful of. But again, all those assets are great. And I highly recommend that you have them put back. But don't count on just that because we want to thrive. We don't want to just get a meager existence out. Okay. And then one thing you've always got to consider if you own property is property taxes. Are you going to be able to pay your property taxes? 
You may lose your job. You're sitting there. You got food stored up to the ceiling. Man, I'm in good shape. Mm -hmm. And then the tax man's going to come knocking on your door. And you've got to be able to pay those taxes, which is really pathetic. Some states don't have property tax. And I think that's a incredible because, you know, once you have something, it should be yours. Yeah, then you actually own it. Yeah, you actually own it because really what you're doing is you're paying rent. Mm -hmm. OK, we're going to go. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to talk one more thing and then we're going to go to some questions. OK, job loss. I want you to consider what industry are you in? What is are you recession proof? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? One of the things that happened during the Great Depression is people were working at factories. They were in the automotive, whatever. They were in these different businesses. And when the economy went down, they just got laid off. So then people were scrambling around just trying to do anything they could possibly do. What is your job situation? Is it recession proof? Have you seen layoffs or are there are there possible layoffs? So look at that. Now, I'm not telling you to change jobs. You do what you do, but having a side gig will give you something on the side mm -hmm. or learning or going to school and getting another skill, working on that, being aware that your industry is not recession proof is really important to, to identify so that you can go ahead and start thinking about a backup plan just in case. One of the things about storing up a lot of food and things like that is that during that time, you can eat if you're making limited income. You have the food there to eat mm -hmm. and you can take the money you would have spent on food or rent and you can use it toward your your bills. And so you do have the food. So that cuts out on your food bill. That's just a side note. OK, let's go to some questions. Uh, Paul Frank asks, question, given the digital night vision is not as good as military versions, do you recommend? And if so, monocular or binocular? I like the reason why I like monocular and you can, you can pitch in on this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have both. I have some of the digital night vision and it, it's still better than nothing. In fact, it's, it, there's some pretty decent stuff out there. There's some really good stuff out there. And, and the thing is there night vision right now is limited by your, your budget night vision right now is limited by how good your infrared illuminator is. If you've got a really high quality infrared illuminator, it's going to allow you to see a lot further um, and be able to see a lot more, uh, a lot more clearly with a, with a lower quality night vision monocular um, than it would with, with one that's just using a little low quality infrared illuminator. So the, the infrared illuminator is the big thing that you need to look at with whatever kind of uh, budget night vision you're looking at. Me personally, I'm like you, I prefer a monocular over the binoculars. Uh, one, they get a lot better battery life. So you're, you're able to use them a lot longer. There's a lot of the stuff that's out there now offers uh, video recording and you can do uh, night photography and stuff with it. To me, that's not that big a deal. I'm looking for something that's going to give me the longest battery life possible with uh, the minimal amount of power draw. So I don't need to be able to record stuff and things like that. I just want to be able to see at night with whatever kind of night vision I'm using. Yeah. And really, he's right. You have a good illuminator and I have a PBS 14. It's wonderful. But, you know, I still need an illuminator. Mm -hmm. And so having illumination, it really helps you a lot. Uh, I would I would recommend looking at psionics. It's it's weird. It's they don't claim it to be true night vision. Yeah. But man, it is incredible. And you put especially when you use an illuminator, it really brightens up things. But there are some really good systems out there. And one of the things I was at a uh, night fighting class at TNBC, it was Gunfighter 101 or Night Fighter. And one of the things that the instructor said when we first got there is that night vision is a superpower. When nobody else has it and you've got night vision, mm -hmm. you are on top. So I highly recommend at least something with night vision. Make sure, though, that you keep your batteries. If you have alkaline batteries it's using, yeah. take them out because I've ruined some leaving them in. All right. Uh, UFOs, no joke, uh, ask, got any suggestions for the best shooter gas mask? I'm looking at a Mira CM7M. Can you top that? Uh, Mira is making some of the best on the market. Uh, I have a number of them. They're good. They're incredible quality. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people go out and they buy surplus and, and you're get you don't know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about if you're serious about having a good gas mask, I would highly recommend the Mira system. 
and definitely the you know i like the one that you can shoot off of i mean that makes it nice the mirrors are nice uh and then also the uh if you can find new old stock uh military gas masks that are like our current stuff that we're issuing our troops but pick up the uh, new old stock that's dated out but it's never been used that's a really good option as well. Yeah. And they're made for storage. I mean, yeah, U.S. military, but I'd be careful with like European yes. gas mask and funky filters and stuff. The big thing for me is, is to make sure that I can procure more filters That's if right. I need them. That's right. And one that actually you can have them that ha that actually has a straw, which mm -hmm. makes it really nice on the, uh, the military ones. Yep. You can drink from it. Uh, David Delaney asks questions, thoughts. I feel local healthcare is good micro business to grow when SHTF um, local nurse and psychotherapist services as folks will need and appreciate it with low local overheads. Good option. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, medical field is massive. My wife said, well, she was a labor and delivery nurse for 20 years and now she's gotten more into alternative medicines and alternatives. And um, you know, that is one thing that's really growing. And being able to care and help people is huge, especially in and to our medical system since COVID is just ruined. It's just it's just ruined. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's terrible. <laughs> and uh, having some different alternative medications and being able to know those things, because it takes a lot of skill, a lot of research and a lot of study to make sure you're doing the right things. But if you have those skills, I think that's probably one of, if not the most recession proof industry that you could get into would be, would be in the medical field. Uh, whether you're working for a large medical system or whether you're doing something privately on your own, I, I think there's a huge opportunity there for individuals that are in that field uh, to be able to grow and expand and really create something for themselves. Yes. Uh, Brad Jenkins says, what do you think about stocking seeds for vegetables and such seeds that will reproduce? I think that that is a great idea. The big downturn to seeds is after five years, you're going to have, you know, they usually have about a five year shelf life, That's right? If they're sealed, if they're contained. And the problem is, and we were talking about this the other week mm -hmm. is when you, you get a lower yield every year. So uh, you want to be careful uh, with, you know, as far as preserving them, I think some people even put them in the freezer before to keep the shelf, you know, keep them up. But uh, that's going to be your biggest downturn is, and I know a lot of people that have bought these bat, these seed banks mm -hmm. and they put them up and go, oh, I got my seed bank. And 10 years later, <laughs> they pull them down and there's nothing there. Yeah. Hardly. One out of a hundred seeds actually sprouts. That's one of the big things. If you're, if you're buying seeds, you not only need to buy those seeds, you need to plant those seeds and then harvest your seeds from that year and dry them. So you have good seeds for the coming years. Yes, that is that is the best recommendation. OK, we'll come back to some questions in a minute. Um, OK, what will be in demand? What is it that's going to be in demand? So you're looking for your side gig or you're looking for something to get into. What is it first that people just need? Obviously, food is a big one. Mm -hmm. People don't need food. Uh, one thing that we do, we go and we buy a cow every year and we have a process. She does the whole thing and they take care of it. And then it's grain fed, no hormones, all that stuff. And then we have somebody that's up the street that has chickens and they have eggs. And they'll, you know, we do stuff like this all the time where we're, we're looking for alternatives. And so getting into something like that, whether it's gardening, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, hunting, even hunting. If you can hunt game meat and be able to process it, there's a, you know, there's a great way. That's a great way to be able to market things. Now, obviously, there's health department issues and things like that. Uh, and you want to know your laws. But even fishing, going fishing, being able to find meat, having chickens, rabbits, cattle, goats, whatever it is, husbandry. So having that, gardens are, are awesome. They're awesome, number one, just for you to eat and eat healthier. Uh, Robbie and I are big about gardens mm -hmm. and, you know, we think it because here's the other thing, guys, about a garden. You know, a lot of people that are prepper minded that are kind of like obsessed and they're just buying stuff is they don't have a garden necessarily. A lot of people do, but you don't have a garden and you think I'm just going to go out there and start growing things. You <laughs> run into a lot of issues. You do. And and it's a growing it's it's a growing a skill. Learning curve it's a it, learning curve. Sure. And, uh, you know, with their insects, blight, uh, different diseases, 
how your soil reacts to different vegetables and things. Uh, what type of soil do you have to right. begin with? Right. So there's a lot to be said about knowing what you're doing when it goes to gardening. And the best way to learn is just to get out there and to make that, to do your thing. One thing that we did one year was uh, my wife decided she was going to put in a bunch of, uh, bring in a bunch of soil. And it was the Cadillac mix. Mm -hmm. We had the worst garden ever. <laughs> we had a, I had a better garden down in the, just the red dirt that we have. And so, you know, is there's learning curves and how to like hornworms. We'd never had hornworms before and we had them like crazy eating our tomatoes. So learning how to, to, to defeat those and doing it without maybe pouring on a bunch of pesticides. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of learning that needs to go on. Uh, markets, markets will open. Uh, and you see that with flea markets and different little places. But in a when recession starts, you're going to see more and more markets come up, um, you know, and if you want to do if you want to be a vendor at that market, what are you going to sell? What 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 are you going to look for? Um, you know, it was funny. I was talking about this earlier about seeds. You know, somebody asked the question about seeds. And in the book by John Wesley Rawls called Survivors, which I highly recommend that book. Uh, there was one girl that just started buying seed and she put it back and she put it, you know, she just started and she had a big closet full of seed. She saw the economy crashing. I mean, it was just crashing. And so she moved to a rural area and opened up a little store. And when inflation had just taken money, they would trade stuff with her. And so before long, she had a trading post with all kind of stuff. And she was very particular about what she took in. But, you know, there are ways to be, and this is, of course, a fictional story, but there are ways to be able to utilize your skills and maybe what you have on hand to be able to barter and trade. You know, you could maybe, one thing we used to do, I used to do this. I would go to auctions and I would pick up really cool stuff at very reasonable prices. Mm -hmm. And I would put it on eBay and double my money. This is when eBay was really big, but even eBay still big. But made a, I mean, I was making a full-time living off of just selling antiques. And just auctions. reselling stuff you were buying. Yep. Right. Because, yep. you know, you, you find the value, you go to the preview, you look at it, you see what the prices are, you bring it back and boom, you've got, you're making great money. So again, side gigs, I'm big about side gigs. And you know, I'll tell you one thing, and that's, that is a great thing that you can get into. Uh, any of you could get into that and doing that right now today, uh, going to auctions and buying things. One of the big things that you want to look out for if you're going to an auction to be able to buy stuff is to make sure that that auction is only a local auction and they they don't have an online component that goes along with it. A lot of times what you'll run into, if there's an online component that goes along with it, where they're selling live as well as virtually online is somebody online may bid that item up and buy it because they want it and, you know, take away all of your value that you're going to be able to get um, by buying it and reselling it. So local auctions that don't do the online selling, a lot of times you can get a lot better prices on stuff and be able to turn those items over for a profit a lot That's easier. Right. Yard sales. You can do that at yard sales. You can do it at yep. flea markets. But, you know, the, the thing is, is knowing what you're looking for. That's right. And if you get into specific things, you might be able to get some deals. But, you know, that's going to take some skill. It's going to mm -hmm. take some practice. Yep. It's going to take some losses. But it's something to, again, a side gig idea. Um Cutting hair. My grandmother, during the Great Depression, she cut hair. I mean, that's what she did. She wasn't a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. She just started cutting hair and, and learned how to do it. And so my grandfather was in, actually, he was in seminary. While he was in school, she would go and she would, people would call her and they'd pay her very little. I mean, it was because during the time, you could there was only so much money around. Yep. But they made through life because she was cutting hair. Simple thing. Um handyman being good at just doing things. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that happened during the great depression. So a lot of people went around and just did odd jobs. So finding odd jobs, but you've got to have some skill and know how to fix things. But if you do, it's a great way in having the tools to be able to use to fix things. Well, you know, I think that's the a handyman is a great opportunity. Even, even when times are normal, yeah. you know, money's well, people are making good money, but you know, the the old saying, you know, you've either got one of two things in life. You either have time or you have money, but you never have both. So you have people that are making really good money. They don't have a whole lot of time on their hands. So they need a ceiling fan changed out or a drain changed under their sink or, you know, little projects around their house that they're willing to pay someone, pay you to do 
because they don't have the time to be able to do that themselves. You can make a really good living just being a handyman. Sure. Yeah. And like plumbers and electricians, yep. those guys make a lot of money, but it's hard to get them out because it's a smaller job. Mm -hmm. They'd rather work on a bigger project. That's right. So having people that are willing to say, hey, I'm, I've got time this evening or doing whatever. And, you know, it could even be auto repair or whatever. I mean, because of the computers, that makes it a little different. But a lot of people can do those things. That's right. Big, small things. Um, OK, so trading post. We kind of talked about that a little bit with the seed, but having some supplies and bartering and trading to upscale, not just to trade because you have something you're like, oh, I just need that. And you want this, you know, actually have a, a way to be able to barter and trade. It takes some skill, but you can learn it. Uh, and that's something that's not necessarily going on today. But if you know, my grandfather always said it was uh, what's the biggest thing about a trade is what you buy it for. You can get it cheap. Mm -hmm. Then you can go and you can trade up. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a way to be able to buy. It. And people do this all the time where they buy stuff. They get on Facebook Marketplace or whatever, and they'll get something and then they'll resell it to someone for a higher price. Uh, people, there's a lot of people that used to do that a lot, yep. you know. They yep. go around and say, hey, I got so-and-so. And they did it by word of mouth. And before long, they're making money. And it was fun for them. It is, and it's fun. Um, okay. Survival supplies. I've got that down on the list. You maybe want to get into a survival industry. Uh, the only problem is, is if you can get the supplies. So, yep. you, know, you know, that's a that's a big thing. Any type of industry that you're going to get into, there there's always going to be supply demand issues, you know is either you don't have enough supply to meet demand or you have too much supply and there's not enough demand. So that's always a, you know, kind of a double-edged sword getting into a, uh, any type of industry like that is, is there going to be enough market to be able to sustain what I'm wanting to do? Are there enough people wanting to buy what I'm trying to sell? Right. Like ammunition, you know, yeah. when they have a, a run on ammunition, you know, a lot of the gun stores went up on price mm -hmm. and everybody fussed about it. But the problem was, is they couldn't replace it. And they had to make enough money to pay their rent and pay their people and everything else. And so, you know, I do understand that, but you don't want to gouge people. But then again, you don't want to sell off your supplies where right. people are willing to pay a little bit more. Well, and here's the thing is, it's, is it really gouging if, if you paid $8 for a box of ammunition and now you're selling it for 20, but it's going to cost you 18 to replace that ammunition. Right. Yeah. It's just, once again, it's, it's a capitalist system. You know, it's supply and demand. It's, do people want what I have and are they willing to pay for what I have? Now, if, if you're still buying it for $8 a box and you're selling it for 20, yeah, you're gouging people. But you know, if, as long as the, the price that you're paying it for is relative to what you're selling it for, you know, you're, you're, it's good business, business right. practice. Well, supply and demand is just a principle. Yep. Uh, alterations, you know, you may be able to do some alterations, hemming up pants, repairing mm -hmm clothes you know you, somebody's got a busted knee and you can put a piece of cloth sew it in you know we used to see that a lot during the great depression it's a lost skill yeah it really is that's something that you really just don't see anymore in our disposable lifestyle that we have you know people they they get a hole in their pants and you know either it's fashionable and they wear it like that <laughs> or they throw them away and go buy a new pair of pants but you just don't see hemming and alterations and and patching and repairing clothes like you used to but then there's, you know, just sewing. That's another lost art. Mm -hmm. My mother always sewed and, you know, having a sewing machine and being able to sew, and which would also lend to repairing stuff, but but actually making clothes. Uh, weaving, if you want to get down to the bottom. Uh, we have a good friend of ours. She has a weaver and she'll set, she has that thing set up. It's really cool. It's yeah. expensive and there's a lot to it, but that's just something that she likes to do. And she can make all kind of things. Yeah. Weaving and crocheting. Yeah. You know, crocheting. Those, those are, those are skills that you know, I think they're, they're just not being passed on like they used to be. Right. Okay. Blacksmith, you know, if you, something that you want to get into and something, you know, that's a propensity, you know, you have a propensity for, and you have a place, you know, blacksmithing can create a lot of different things. And so it gives you an option. The thing is, is again, the raw materials, mm -hmm. but if you can, if you have a supply of that, that's a, that's something to think about. And two, some of these things are really just based on things that people are going to need that they needed in the 1800s. Man still needs what he needs. He needs food, clothing, shelter, and heat. Well, you know, one of the one of the things of blacksmithing, there's a lot of alternative methods for gathering steel to be able to, to blacksmith. You know, you've got your 
your junkyard that has all your scrap cars, you know, the, the leaf springs and the coil springs, there, there's really good steel on, on automobiles that can be transferred over into the blacksmithing industry and reworked into things that are useful. Right. We well, you know so, the cookery. Yep. It, that's made from leaf springs mm -hmm. on an automobile. Yep. So it's not, you know, just getting online and ordering a bunch of, you know, 4140, you know, cold rolled steel and hammering it out and making stuff out of it. It's finding things that you can make stuff out of that, that would have normally been scrapped and thrown away. Right. Um, pottery, you know, if that's something that, you know, pottery can be something that would be a lot of fun, but yet it's something that people can use, especially mm -hmm. again, in a downturn situation. Um, security, being in security. Uh, you know, if, if things and this is one thing that for foul said is that the big thing that the big indicator was that as the economy went down, crime went up. And, you know, and then also we have our defund the police and all those things that are going on. So security is a big deal. Uh, I was in a store this this week and I was talking to the lady that owns it. And she said they had a, a store invasion one time. They had somebody mm -hmm. they had these four guys come in and took a sledgehammer and busted out a bunch of their display glasses. They were just standing there. And uh, even though they had guns put away, they just, the guys took off and left. And so they were, they had law enforcement in there this time, but that happened to them. And so security is a big deal. Um, well, and as you see crime increasing, you're going to see a bigger need for security, right? Whether it's security at stores, security at gas stations, you know, I, I found it kind of ironic. You know, I went, when I was in Guatemala a few months ago on a mission trip, uh, every gas station that you stopped at, there were armed security guards at the gas pumps. Wow. Every single gas pump had an armed security guard at the pump. And then there were armed security guards inside the stores as well. And almost all of your stores had armed guards inside the stores. And, you know, I remember back in the, the late seventies, early eighties, even here in in South Carolina, where where we are, you'd go in the grocery store or one of your big box stores, and there would be an armed security guard inside that store. He was usually a retired police officer that was working as an armed guard inside that store as a theft deterrent. And you don't you don't see those things anymore, uh, predominantly in the United States. But as we see crime start to increase. I think that could be a very good opportunity for someone to get into. Well, you know, when I was gig. when I was in high school and I worked at a grocery store mm -hmm. and there was a guy set up on this yep. up high yep. and he had a shotgun and he just sat up there, but he was about 90 years old. I, I don't the, think he could have done anything. I know the store you're talking about <laughs> over there on uh, Cedar Line Road. No, this was no? on uh, Lawrence Road. Okay. But they had him a lot. They had them all over. They did. I mean, Most of your grocery stores had those. A lot of yep. them. So, you know, that is another possibility, especially if you're former military mm -hmm. or police. That's that's a, a great option. And then not necessarily even that. But yep. security is a big deal. Um, let me see. Okay. Entertainment. We talked about this a minute ago, but whether you're a singer and it's funny because, you know, singers, people are still going to want to be entertained. That's right. And, you know, so singers and, you know, if you watch on the streets, a lot of times people are sitting there and then, especially in downtown Greenville, it's actually kind of cool. Yep. They'll have people come out and just play music and they'll open up their case or whatever. And people throw money in it. And some of them are really good. Yeah. Yep. But, um, you know, if you can bring entertainment and some happiness to somebody, you know, they may not have a lot, but they may be willing to give you some and and build that up. Um, then, of course, again, with social media, there's a lot of different options with that. And then um, glass blowing, which is kind of an odd one, but I just threw it in there because I was thinking about, you know, glass is a perishable. <laughs> and, uh, and it's one thing that a lot of people do. One thing, too, about some of these, like blacksmithing, like pottery, like glass blowing, like candle making. Candle mm -hmm. making is another one. And candle making is probably the most viable as far as a way to be able to continue to produce. And probably is, one of the easiest to get started with that doesn't require a ton of skill. Right, right. But is that you can get into some of these and during a decent economy, mm -hmm. make money. Yep. You know, I mean, pottery, especially in Western North Carolina, we used to huge, buy pottery and huge. it is expensive. Yep. It is beautiful, beautiful pieces. So, you know, those are ways. Now, the one thing, though, is and this is something that's funny is scavengers. Now, a lot of times we've talked about scavengers and a scavenger toolbox, actually, things you need to have in an SHTF grid down. Everything's going south. But scavenging 
can be something that you can do as a business. And there are people that do it. Yep. A lot of people, uh, they'll go into an area and they'll collect metal and they'll take it to a recycling area and they'll pay, get paid for it. Uh, metal here lately has been down some, but a lot of times scrap metal, that's a big business. Mm -hmm. One thing we did was we took a bunch of scrap and we had a place not a couple of miles away and we would go and we, you'd load up in your pickup truck. You get there and you get weighed. And then when you drive off and they dump it, they weigh you again and they pay you for the amount of metal that you have. And, but on the other side of that is going and finding raw materials to be able to use. Just like you were talking about a blacksmith. Mm -hmm. He's going to want some of those items to be yep. able to re repurpose. And it may be just things that you can repurpose. The glass blower. Yeah. There's tons and tons of scrap glass oh, that you yeah. can purchase to be able to, to blow glass out of. That's a good you point. Know, you don't have to go and buy all of these new fancy boxes of crushed up glass to be able to, to make your, your art out of. You can buy scrap glass or a lot of times pick up scrap glass for free to be able to make your blown glass art out of. And a lot of times, you know, like in some of these third world countries, they mm -hmm. use just raw, whatever they can find right. to build. Like I, I saw one thing in Africa where they had taken two liter soda bottles and mm -hmm. made them into windows. Yep. So they could at least keep it and have some light coming in. And you know, the term scavenger has, it, it's almost, it's almost a dirty word. You know, it's like people, you know, if you're a scavenger, you know, people I think tend to look down on, on that term. And, and but the thing about it is that is a realistically is probably one of the easiest ways that you can make money for a low overhead. That's right. Low overhead, low initial investment or no initial investment other than the time that it takes to go and pick up the materials that you're scrapping and we, scavenging. We know a lot of times like we've had some things before. We had a go kart one time that we it just we it started messing up and we just couldn't get it fixed. And we had some friends of ours just called them and said, Hey, I got this. We wanted it out of our yard mm -hmm. or behind the house actually, but they came and picked it up, took it off, you know, and they were going to try to fix it up. So a lot of times people will give you stuff for free. That's right. Just to take. That's right. And, um, so, you know, again, it's just one of those things, but you'll know, you'll need some tools, but really the overhead's low. And that's one of the things about all of these different things is, you're not having to, you know, let's say a, a food truck or you have, you know, you're selling food out of whatever. And again, you got a health department, whatever to deal with. But, you know, is a restaurant may close because it doesn't have enough business and because they have rent and they have employees and they have, you might be able to produce something to where you have a low overhead mm -hmm. and be able to thrive during that yep. time. That's right. So, you, do, you know, you don't want your overhead to be too big on any of these things. That's the biggest thing with starting any type of side gig is to minimize your overhead. <clears throat> the lower you can keep your overhead, the more profit you're going to have initially and the more profit you're going to have long term to be able to con continue to grow that business. You know, it's 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 all about keeping your prop your costs down in any type of business and especially starting a new business, any type, any type of gig that you're starting, keeping your costs down is going to allow you to be profitable much faster. Well, you know, there's this girl that uh, we found her first in front of uh, a fresh market, which is one of the really nice uh, grocery stores. She was selling sweet potato pies. Mm -hmm. She They were homemade <clears throat> sweet potato pies. They were nicely boxed. She had them sitting out. And it was funny because she was sitting over there and her two sons were sitting behind her just over there. And, uh, I just kind of, I thought, wow, that's pretty cool that she's being such an entrepreneur yeah. that she's willing to do this. And so I bought one of those pies. That was the best pie I've ever had. It was absolutely phenomenal. And I had to be careful because I'd have eaten the whole thing <laughs> and they weren't cheap. They were about 25 bucks a piece, yeah. but they were so good. So now we've gotten to where we'll buy those pies. So if you start a business and the one thing about you know, having a storefront, having all that stuff is you're very visible. Mm -hmm. But the real key is to have word of mouth. Yep. And if you're doing something with quality and you're putting some really effort into it, and you're doing something well, people will, the word will get around. I do that. If there's somebody that I've had a really good experience with, Absolutely. I'll say, hey, you need to go there. And that's really what does it even more than visibility. Because mm -hmm. once you go into a restaurant, the food's not all that good. I don't care if it's on Wall Street or, yeah. or you know, towns, whatever. It's you know, it's going to go out of business because it's just not good. So word of mouth is a big plus. So whatever you choose, you know, if you, when you want to get your side gig going is to put effort, quality, 
don't cut corners, mm-hmm. do a good job and keep your word. So if you're going to, like if you're a handyman and you're going to do something and you tell somebody, then do that, make it, make it very important. You know, it was funny. I was watching this thing. It was a, it was about <coughs> confessions of killers. It was a police interrogations. I don't know why I was watching it, but I was watching this thing and this kid had killed somebody and didn't really have any remorse for it. But the one thing he did was the, the cop said, are you, a, are you a man of your word? And he goes, oh, yeah, I'm a man of my word. I will always tell you the truth. And mm-hmm. So he'd ask him something. He'd tell him. But yet he'd killed somebody. So people really value uh, a person of their word. And so when you're putting all this together, and it really goes into all the prepping. If you, know, if you want people to count on you, if you want people to have confidence in you, be a person of your word. And that goes really strong into business. Okay, if we got some more questions, we'll take them. Uh, JC asks, what recommendations do you guys have for a mandatory and participation for a new digital currency? I am extremely against any kind of digital currency uh, because, you know, we'll lose our privacy immediately. Uh, you know, the one thing about digital currency is that at this point right now, and you may say, well, I got a card, it's digital. I mean, you know, it goes around, but there are petitions at these banks to be able to block things. And so they can't just go, ah, right, we're going to cut that off. The one thing is with the digital currency, it's a central location that's controlling everything. I will, I do not like that. So what I do is I buy a lot of gold and silver. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the biggest things to me that's a hedge that I can take. And if I need to barter and trade, I can. Uh, And of course, cash. But the problem with having a lot of cash, I think you should have cash on hand. But having a lot of cash is going to be affected by inflation. Mm -hmm. So let's say that a couple of years ago, I bought a bad or and two, it's more susceptible to like if your house catches on fire or a flood happens, you can lose that cash. It can be completely destroyed. So that's one thing I like about gold and silver is even if it's melted down to a blob, it's still gold and silver. So I think that there are ways to be able to hedge yourself to protect yourself against it. I'll be honest with you, an economic collapse or digital currency takeover, you know, that, those are neither one of those are good signs. So I think being able to barter, looking more toward barter, looking more toward, you know, again, having cash, which they're trying to do away with that. And then, of course, the gold and silver is God's currency. It's something that's been around since the beginning. It will continue to be of value. And so I think those are some ways to hedge it. But we have to stand against that digital currency because it's going to it's going to ruin everything. Mm, Tommy Live say says, what state does not have property taxes? I'm ready to move to Tennessee and Florida. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Tennessee and Florida. <laughs> there may be others, but those are two states that do not have property taxes. So um, and that's probably why Tennessee is being invaded mm. Uh, but of course we are too. We're, we're having just massive amounts of people that are pouring into our area. And it is so, I mean, it's not like we're just being told that it's like you try to get out on the road and it's like, holy crap, this is crazy. So, um, people are subdivisions are going up by the thousands, but yeah, if I was going to move from one location to another, I probably would move more toward Tennessee or toward Florida. uh, If you want to deal with the hurricanes, but that's a beautiful state. Uh, Valor Defense says, question, thoughts on upcoming ammo crisis and gunpowder shortage. Yeah, so gun, <clears throat> the gunpowder shortage thing has been, that, that's not something new. It, it's continuing to get worse, um, especially with the fact that we don't have the raw materials. Uh, we're not producing the raw materials in our country to be able to make gunpowder. We're importing all of that. Um, the nitrocellulose or cellox that's used for gunpowder the last company that was producing that in the United States and North Carolina burned down a couple of years ago. So all of our, our uh, nitrocellulose that's being used for single base and double base gunpowders is being imported now. And that's driving the cost up. Uh, the majority of our gunpowder itself in our country is being imported right now. And that's driving the cost up. Um, I've, I've said for years, you know, if you reload, stock up on gunpowder because that's going to be the one thing gunpowder and primers are going to be the two things that are going to be the most difficult to get. Um, I still say that if you can get gunpowder, buy it, stock up on it. Uh, 
and it's going to allow you to be able to load your ammunition on your own. As far as uh, ammunition cost increases, you know, we got a uh, letter a couple of weeks ago from uh, the Reming. I'll, I'll use Remington as the the head, but it's like Remington CCI Federal um, was Vista Spear. Yeah, under the Vista brand, they they sent out a letter that they were going to have a minimum six percent price increase across the board on all of their ammunition, and, and that's from the wholesale level, and that's going to get passed all the way up to consumers. Uh, so everyone is going to see an increase in ammunition starting January 1. And that doesn't matter if you had uh, purchase orders already placed with these companies for 2024. They're canceling those purchase orders and reissuing the purchase order with the 6% price increase included in it. Uh, so you are going to see a big increase in ammunition cost in 2024. Well, and... Um Primers, they're so expensive. Yeah. Uh, we were at the gun show this past weekend. It was like, are you kidding me? Uh, and, which, and they're having shortages on primers. Yeah. You can't even get primers. And that's one of the problems. Some of the ammo companies that are getting imported primers, some mm -hmm. of them are too hard and they're causing a lot of malfunctions. Yep. So the quality of ammunition is, is in some places is suffering. So, um, you know, and even, even domestically produced ammunition. You know, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's a gunsmith yesterday. He called me and he said, hey, When's the last time you saw a uh, case head separation in a 22 long rifle? And I was like, well, actually, <laughs> I saw about seven a few weeks ago. And he said, I had three yesterday from three different companies or three different customers with three different brands of ammunition that had uh, blew the primers out. And one of them completely destroyed the gun. And then the other two just broke the uh, broke the extractor and one of them cracked the slide on a pistol. But he had three 22s yesterday that were brought into him that wow. had bad ammunition that destroyed the gun and brand new com currently produced ammunition that somebody had just purchased. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of these people that are buying and selling, but, um, Valor defense. Good to see you, man. Uh, Herrick ask any recommendations for bug out bag foods? Uh, I personally like, um, lifeboat food. It's just, it, but the thing is you can get a 3000 uh, calorie bar mm -hmm. and they're made for five year shelf life. Uh, they're wrapped in mylar. Uh, you can get them 25, you can get different types, different sizes. They taste like a very, almost like pie crust. It's got a, almost like a, you know, just graham cracker, but yet it's got a very easy way to, to eat it and it doesn't make you thirsty. That's just really my personal favorite for, you know, my get home bag, a bug out bag. Now yeah. for, for, yeah. A, a, you know, a 24 hour bag or a 72 hour bag. I think you're absolutely right because it, it's small, it's compact. It doesn't eat up a lot of bag space. That's a great, great option. Um, you know, I'm big on MREs uh, just because it, it actually tastes like food, um, <laughs> you know, and, and that's yeah. a morale booster. You know, it really is, you know, when you can, when you can sit down and, you know, even in a, a survival situation, you sit down and eat something that, that tastes really good. Um, you know, that, that's going to be a morale booster for you. So I'm, I'm a big fan of MREs. Now, what I do is I don't leave them in the big bag that they come in. I cut them out of the bag and I take the, uh, the entree out of the bag and the entree goes into my, uh, into my, my, my 24 hour bag or my 72 hour bag. Um, and I just put the entrees in there because I can put more entrees in there than I can that, uh, that big bag that everything comes in. Yeah. MREs are a great option. And two, if you want to, heat it you can do, use the heater and yep. you don't have to create a fire that's right uh but that yeah those are those are great and of course you know mountain house and all those those are some good options you just typically need a little stove or something to be able to cook it but still a good option but again lifeboat food's my best my favorite um okay it's one o'clock guys and that that went by pretty quick i yeah. thought we were going to actually end early <laughs> and we just kind of uh but guys again don't be obsessed with prepping find yourself a side gig you need to prep, prep, do it, do it right. But get yourself a side gig to be able to earn that extra money to be able to pay for those preps. But also in a, a bad economy and an economic collapse, regardless of the severity of that collapse. Again, this could be just like we're dealing with right now and That's saying, right. you know what, I need some extra money because it's getting expensive. Well, it gives you a way to be able to, to produce some income. And, uh, and hopefully these are some ideas in the comments. If you have some other suggestions, please leave them.
because it's always great to be able to look and to see those different suggestions. And also, I'll be continuing this live at 6 p.m. Eastern on my YouTube channel, Robbie Wheaton. Uh, so if you had some questions that you didn't get answered today during this one, pop over on my YouTube live tonight and uh, we can answer your questions there at 6 p.m. Eastern. And the link for his channel is down below in the description. Also, uh, we really do appreciate ExoTac. If you don't have a fire kit, I highly recommend you have one. A big lighter is not a fire kit. A big lighter is fine, but you need some other to have redundancy. And also, and you get a 20% off using Suits 20 with the link down below in the description. Made in Winder, Georgia. These guys are awesome. Great little stocking stuffer. Yeah, yeah, they really are. And also, the Modern Survival Guide for the Coming Economic Collapse by Fafal. Links down below in the description. This is an incredible book and uh, about the actual events in Argentina that uh, happened back in 2001. Great book. Uh, we will not be having live next week uh, because obviously of, of Christmas coming up and then we will actually be out of town. So no live next week. And we really do appreciate you guys being here again. A big, huge thanks to Robbie Wheaton for being here and uh, do check out his live. Also, he has the Robbie Wheaton YouTube channel. You can check that out and Sarah Mack for keeping us uh, with questions from you guys. And if we didn't get to your questions, we apologize. We just get busy. <laughs> so be strong, be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the Republic.